remember me uh, mentioning <laughs> meta narrative? <laughs> yeah, at least remember the word. Yeah, except for the big story. Yeah, no, yeah the big story. It's the big story. So I think it's always good to remember that so that when we get into the minutia of, of uh, the word here that we don't lose sight of the big story. Because if we lose sight of that, then we will not get really what's going on. So the meta -nar narrative is God created everything that is in existence out of nothing, ex nihilo. God created the universe, he, and the crowning jewel of his creation was what? Man. man, because he made man his own image. And the reason he created all things was to bring glory to himself. Not, not that he was an egomaniac or anything else. And, and it's not his creation adds to its glory. It reflects his glory, who he is. And then as the story goes on, man fell. Because God wanted a loving relationship with his crown jewel of his creation. And in order to have that, he had to give him free will. And that free will, as we all know, was taken to go against what God said. So the rest of the, of the story, uh, or the continuation of the story, is that God didn't give up on us, his creation, but he redeemed us. He, he has a plan to redeem us. So even with the free will and going the wrong way, he gave opportunity for those who want to to get back on his his plan. And that redemptive story is what's going on, and we're in the middle of that redemptive story. The final part of, of the meta narrative is that he's going to restore all that was corrupted, the paradise that he intended that has become corrupted, he will restore it. And that will be the final thing. So we're in this time of redemption. Now, where do you think the book of Acts fits into that? Because then there are, and this is where uh, the idea of meta and what Mike's talking about, there are many sub-narratives going on, OK? Many sub-narratives. One of those sub-narratives is Acts. That's a sub-narrative. Where does that fit in? Why do you think that God wanted the book of Acts recorded? in his scriptures, in the complete scriptures. Why do you think it's here? Jim? Well, we talked about the, the spirit and the work that the spirit did initially. Now, this little section here, we were dealing with the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. And, and the bigger picture is the, the, the message of eternal life. The spirit gives life. There's eternal life. And the book of Acts has a lot of that in it, a lot of the thing. OK. Any other thoughts? Well, you've, you've heard the thing say that Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, who wrote Acts? Luke. What else did Luke write? Luke. 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 Hey, you guys are sharper than I were back on track. Well, I was there for a while, Doug. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and he wrote it to a man named Theophilus. Right? Remember when he wrote the Gospel of Luke, that why he wrote it? What was he doing? He wanted to give an account of the, the events surrounding Jesus. Right? And an accurate account. He did his homework and gathered the information. Now, a sequel to his Gospel is the Book of Acts. Right? So what do you think specifically? First of all, what genre? You all right with that word? Genre? Genre? Uh, what genre is is action? And I know, Jerry, you don't like any of this stuff, but I'm, I'm, we'll get into the good stuff. I'm totally talking. Okay. I won't remember a thing. Neither one of the rest of us. So what, John, what genre is the book of Acts? Historical. Historical. It's a historical narrative. Okay, so with those pieces, why do you think God, what does God want to communicate by inspiring Luke to write Acts, how does that fit into the meta narrative? It's an encouragement. It is, but what? If, but we do, when we read a historical narrative, well, how are we supposed to read it? What's it trying to accomplish? Jesus, the truth. Jesus. Well, it's 
telling you what happened, but it, it, the meta narrative part was Adam separated our relationship with with God from when, when he sinned in the garden, and so Jesus restored that relationship and allowed us access to God again through the Holy Spirit. And so the the Book of Acts would be where that relationship is restored in a small group of people who've accepted Christ's gift of eternal life. Right. That would be, I guess, the beginning of that part of the story. Exactly. Yep. Luke is the story. Everything, you remember Jesus said, everything, the, the prophets, and the Psalms, and, and, and everything, the law, was all talking about what? Jesus. Everything was pointing forward to him. He came. Okay? And now there's a shift because then he was crucified and he left. But what he left was who was going to represent him now. And that's his church. And here's the formative stages of this new body called the church. It, it's, a, it's a new group. And we're going to find, they haven't even named it who they are yet. We're going to find out. They don't even know who the, how to identify this group. It's so formative. And this is such a critical part. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about Satan uh, has put into Ananias and Sapphira. And why was, why was this such a, a apparent harsh uh, consequence for them? Because the church here is at its very formative stage. And that's why Satan shows up. <clears throat> I dare say there's not a person in this room that has ever had Satan, an encounter with Satan. You probably, and I probably, have had encounters with demons, the spiritual world, the spiritual battle we talk about. But Satan is not omnipresent. You know that? He's a creative being. He's not the opposite of God. He was created by God. And so he's limited. And that's why we, when we see Satan in the scriptures, at certain spots, those are critical spots in the developing story of redemption. There are critical times because, and Satan showed up there. That's why he showed up big time when the Messiah showed up. And then he showed up here in Ananias and Sapphira, it says. Why? Because if he can nip this movement in the bud, in his mind, right here, because because Jesus says it's like, like a tree, right? Like a this, the, the kingdom of God is like a tree. It's growing and it has continued to grow. But it started down here with these 12 guys. And these 12 guys were, we know that God was the one causing all this to happen because these guys were nothing special. They weren't scholars. They weren't uh, big time leaders. They didn't have anything other than God's spirit. We decided I'm going to choose them. I'm going to work through them. Okay, so what, where we are in, in the process here, this narrative fits into the, into the meta-narrative in, in that God's redemptive plan is going to be continued through the church. And Jesus alluded to, if I might use the word alluded or specifically said, that this other form is going to end. And this other form, meaning the, the temple, he says, is going to be destroyed. And he said that many other things, that this whole order of things is going to be reordered. It's going to be reordering. Now, if we understand that, you see, when we look and we listen to the Sadducees and these religious leaders, they are cloaking their reason for putting all these guys in prison and for combating against this is because they are protecting, and this is what they're saying, they're protecting God's plan. Israel and everything. Else. This is what they say they're doing. This is this is their their way of covering up that we want to remain in power and we don't like the power structure to change because this is attacking that power structure. So that's what's going on in their their head, and that's what's taking place. And we're going to read about how they're filled with jealousy, the antithesis of being filled with the Spirit. We're going to see the contrast of these kinds of things. Bob, you wanted to say something. Oh, the other aspect of a historic narrative is that the power is in the truth and accuracy and objectivity of the writer. Um, 
Luke, uh, being a very educated person, was taken to, to provide this historical narrative of the life of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit following. And uh, I, I have read that his intention was to prepare for a trial for Paul in Rome to a very sophisticated audience. So Luke was doing his best to record accurately what he has seen or known. Uh, and then it's for the readers to read, to, to interpret what the facts mean to them. That, that's one postulating, and it may be the correct one, mm -hmm. that he was preparing this for Paul's trial. That may be true. That it's not, he, he can't, one could not be dogmatic about it. But that doesn't take away the point that, that God uses the talents which it, this is the church, right? The different parts of the church that use the, the talents of Luke to do this work. And he, just like each of us contribute to this as well. And yeah, Luke was a very important uh, part, part to uh, put this together. So as we look at this, what, what did they call this thing? First off, we see that uh, when they got, when, the, when they were in prison, uh, and they were getting out, okay? Uh, verse 19, but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, and he said, what? What did he say in verse 20? To stand in the temple yeah. porch to tell the people the full message of this new life. Now, is that in conflict with what the religious leaders told him to do? Yes. yes. Pretty directly, in, directly opposite of what you're supposed to do. John? Nothing. Oh, nothing. That's a first. <laughs> 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 He's just It's all kinds of wonderful things. Okay, so what what were they told to do? So the 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 thing was wasn't just this angel of the Lord opened up for them to get out, but also told them what to say. And what did he tell them to say? Well, tell the people about this new life. Yeah, it, it's funny. Go in the temple and then uh, speak to the people about this whole, and mine says the whole message of this life. What, see they don't have a name for it, what you're supposed to do. So, so the angel uh, said this life. What is he referring to as this life? <laughs> John, you already, got, you already gave you a chance. No, Go ahead. Good. Being reborn um, in the spirit of God. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> That's all they told them to talk about? What, what do you think? <clears throat> what do you think about what they did talk about? The new church. Their new body. Okay. A new way of living. A new way of living, yeah. Under the principles of Christ and his teachings. It's a it's a whole new thing. This this uh, how is it new? How is what was going on with these guys that they're trying to name and the angel refers to it as the whole message of this life? What is so radically different about this life? Because this life had never existed before, it had never been seen before. What made it so special, David? John six sixty three might say it. Uh, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The <clears throat> words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and life. Okay. Well, there are a lot of things about the life, but one was that there was really, uh, they were generally humble and they shared things together and the, the servants and the uh, their owners were equal. Uh, there was no Greek or Jew, there was no Good point. circumcised or uncircumcised, any of those differentiation before they were. Yeah. Boy, that was a huge difference, wasn't it? Now there, there's no distinction, male or female. Uh, Jew or Gentile, this is this was totally. For how many years had it gone on that this that was not the case? A long time. Thousands. Thousands. Jerry, I would think one of the things that they would be sharing about this new way of life would 
would be that um, if the laws of God were now written on their hearts and they were able to live and fulfill, you know, Isaiah and all these other prophets that, you know, Moses, all these things have been passed down through all of time, but they would never have the power to do. Now it was now in the spirit it was written in their hearts and they were, they were, they had a communion with God that was completely different and new and fresh and, and they were able to please God by because his spirit was in them. They were yeah. one with yeah. God. And it wasn't something that they tried to do it in and of themselves. It was God was working it out in and through them and his love was with them all the time. What 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 had to go on prior to that in terms of as it related to the temple? as related to the Shekinah glory, which is God's spirit. What was the, what went on before this that you've just described? The sacrifice. They had to do the sacrifices, they had the temple, they had a priest that had to go in there. They couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. And here now there's it's being said that God's spirit, the Shekinah glory who dwelled in the temple, is going to dwell within every believer. Right? That that was dramatic difference, personal relationship, right. and and it was and it was prophesied, was it not? Yeah. Remember Joel? We read about Joel earlier in Acts that this was going to come about. So all this stuff is culminating, and and it's really upsetting the apple cart, so to speak. Roger. Um, one of the things I think that some of the people are struggling with is that the attitude of change with the attitude. Everything in there, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. I mean, that's the whole attitude change is what you get from us. Yeah. That's part of the university, but wow. It's, yeah, it's it's counterintuitive. The Beatitudes are counterintuitive. And that's all part of the of this kingdom that God is setting up on earth. That is actually there and it's but it's in its completeness it won't happen until the restoration but its reality is existing now. I know some of you guys study the kingdom, that, that he is, he's set it up. It's real and it's operating under a new system, right? The kingdom's under a new system of thought and attitude and everything else. Ron? Uh, I always I go back to this kind of question. In terms of, you said, you know, where were we in the, the text in terms of what was really going on? In, in John uh, 13, 34, Christ says, New commandment I give to you that you love one another. And, and in, the, in, the, uh, in the Jewish community, in the world, in fact, I guess, permeated through the whole world, is that that, that was, a, I think, just a, a huge change. That you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another by this, all men will know that you are my disciple. I think that was a paradigm shift, as it were, <clears throat> that you really care about somebody else more than you care about yourself. As you think of the Old Testament, certainly love one another was in the Old Testament. It wasn't new in that sense, right? But what was the difference in the Old Testament with all that was going on? It was there were types and shadows of this reality. Jesus' death and resurrection and his life, there, there were what were called Christophanies. Uh, Jesus didn't come into existence 2,000 years ago. He showed up at various times uh, in the Old Testament as well. But everything was done under types and shadows leading up to. But, but the cross... What Jesus did 2,000 years ago was efficacious. You know what I mean by the efficacious? That it, it, it had effect <clears throat> prior to his existence. Why are you smiling, John? Well, you just got tons of words today. <laughs> I'm, re I'm refreshed. We got, we got beta, <laughs> efficacious. Hey, John, Man, he's working on his vernacular. Man, there it is. I thought he was speaking in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way to talk without a tongue. <laughs> so efficacious meaning that the event that Jesus, his crucifixion, had effect for every believer in the Old Testament as well. It was retroactive. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. So, but everything was operating in types and shadows until the reality 
uh, the substance of that shadow came into existence. And now things are different. We don't have to live. They didn't have to live by types and shadows anymore. And this is what the book of Hebrews is about. They, they were, but now the persecution was coming about, and Jesus said that was going to come too. Okay? But they wanted to go back to the types and shadows because under Judaism, they didn't have to deal with the problems they had to deal with as a Christian. Now, you with me? Somebody else had their hand over. Tom? Uh, back to the question of uh, life and what does this mean in terms of what the angels said. Yeah. Uh, thinking about uh, uh, the word was zoe uh, in Greek, and, and it was uh, also used by John as a, as a synonym for Christ. Uh, and John 1.4, you know, at the beginning of John, when he's talking about the Word and everything, and, and John 1.4 about uh, uh, he was the life, and the life was the light of men. And, and what the Pharisees had told him not to do was to, to talk about this Jesus Christ. And so exactly what the angel was doing is to go back and tell them about Christ. You know, part of what they're doing here is establishing, you know that guy that you, you, you crucified? He, he, he really was the Messiah. And so I, I think that you can read it in that light too. The very thing that the that the Sadducees told them not to do were, was was talk about Christ, and, and the angels saying, "Okay, let's talk about Christ." Yes. Uh, and so he said that's another read of it. Yeah, and, and, it's pro and, and now Jesus was gone. Jesus was now the head of this body, the church. This now is Jesus going forward, the body of Christ. And it wasn't until uh, later in the book of Acts that we'll see that <clears throat> the word uh, Christian came up. It was, and Christian means Messiah uh, follower, Messiah follower, or Messiah, Messiah believer, Messiah, Messiah people. That's what it means, Messiah people. That's how they identify it. But up until, and I think that's chapter 11, and here they don't even have a name to describe these people. All they there's, everything's different. And so they're supposed to preach about the life and all that contained in this life. And we're going to see that the Sadducees understood, I don't know if, it did, if it's this or the next section about, you're trying to put the blood on our head. Was that this one or the next one? Next, next. next one, okay. They understood clearly what was going on here, like, Tom said, you know, that you you are the ones that crucified this, this life. You're the ones that have done this. And they're saying, you're trying to put the blood on our head. And that's exactly correct. We see it all the way through that that's the case. What else was about this new life that that was part of what they, and, and the whole message of this life, and you can think ahead into Acts 2, what, what else was necessary for them to do in this new life? That the, that the angel was telling them. Not only the new life that we have, but what about the message? Sure. How are they supposed to explain? What, what, what did they have to explain about this new life? Jim? Well, you, you talked about the kingdom, and John the Baptist preached that the kingdom of God is at hand. And in Luke 10, 9, Jesus speaking, he said, go out and say the kingdom of God is near. And you've got the split of the, the curtain and so on, and you've referred to Hebrews. So the, the new life is the temple sacrifices are over. The separation of God from God is gone. We have been justified. We can approach the throne of, of grace, and that is that is the message. You don't need these intermediaries anymore. You can go directly to God. And, and in the book, Buying Conspiracy, it talks about the kingdom of God is here right now. We are living in the kings. Right, yeah. right. And that had to be explained. That's right. This this had to be explained to them, and they had to they had to show in in this message that they're going to be broadcast. They, they had to show how this fit into the meta narrative, if you will, or the sub meta narrative. The idea of how did Israel then fit into all this? So so how did all this take place? And you know, Paul in his letters spent a lot of time explaining the connection between between the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures and that. They had to explain that because this was totally new. This was a, a great uh, thing that had to be uh, connected up. Anything else in there? 
they really had to explain Jesus big time, right? Go ahead, Bob. You know, the Shekinah glory of God was seen in the temple in the Old Testament. Now the transition is to the temple of a heart where the Shekinah glory is to shine. And John, in Gospel of John, like Tom pointed out, was very clear as to what that glory is, what that light is. In fact, in, in the first chapter of John, he, he equates the, the Word and the light to Jesus Christ himself. It's capital L-I-G-H-T, light. It is that light, when we have him in, that it is that light that shines forth. And it is up for us to willingly receive that light. And John mentioned this very clearly in, in John 1, 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So this is life, this is light, this is the glory of God that is meant to be with us, to shine out of us, when we have him in the temple of our heart. Right, right. very good, well said. Jerry? Uh, I think another basic thing that they were explaining at this time, I, I can't see how they couldn't, how it wouldn't come up is um, there were tremendous miracles and healings taking place to the point that they would bring their sick and put them in the street that the shadow of Peter would cross them so they wanted to they wanted to take them from that into the deeper aspect of what that was all about you know it's, it's more than just the miracles signs and wonders this is how it happens this is the cause of it Jesus is the way the truth and the life this which this is what makes this all possible so they wanted to take them from the I don't like to use the word superficial, but from, from, from the superficial to the real meat of the matter. So that, that was all part, because it, it was a practical thing. It was, I mean, you know, these are common people, and they're just totally blown away by you know, what's going on, but they have no understanding. They can't fathom it, and so that's part of the explanation, too. I mean, it, it was just a profound time. Excellent. I'm glad you said that. That what, what, is, what is the purpose of the miracles and all this taking place? Science. It is is it the healing? Was the big deal the healing of this beggar? No. That that God heals? No. What what was the purpose of all of these things? Validation. Validation? Yeah. Validation of what? He is who he said he was. This gave credibility to these guys, right? Jesus is the miracles that he did were you can translate when it says miracles attesting miracles. Attesting, they were attesting that he was who he claimed to be. Okay, I'm really glad that everybody. This was one thing I was going to bring us up. I thought we're going to just have to go all over the place on this one, but we're all in agreement, right? And and that that God uses these things. And Jerry, it's just so well said. These, this isn't the big deal. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You know. It points to something greater, and that is a renewal. And you remember that beggar, the renewal wasn't just in his physical makeup. It was renewal in the more important thing, in his relationship with God, in his eternal life. And that fits into the meta narrative that he's going to be in paradise, the, the restoration of this. So if we get caught up in the means becoming the end, we will lose what God really wants to do. And he had to do this. He, he had to give accreditation to this. Ron? Paul. Oh, I'm sorry. Paul has had his hand up forever. Oh, I, I, I just saw it on my... Okay, I'll, I'll and I want Paul to come back next very, week. Well, no, but what it occurs to me, too, is that, since we're talking about miracles, when Jesus was on the earth, it was one and only, it was he only that was performing the miracles. And now, and it and it's clearly says in the scriptures that it wasn't only Peter, or it wasn't only John, but it was all the disciples. And they had talked about how Jesus is gone, 
They're filled with the spirit that he said was going to be the comforter. And so they've had this explanation. So imagine how it looks. Now it's not just the one man who's doing this. It's these followers and these apostles are all of a sudden filled with his power. And so it's not just one guy. Now it's a whole bunch of them. So they're all being drawn in to tell, now they can tell the story about what he really was all about. Right. It's yeah. not just the ones. So imagine what it looked like to the crowd. Yeah. They were used to seeing Jesus, you know, those that were following. We used to seeing just the one. But now it's all of them. And they're yeah. speaking in different languages. And yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and these these guys, at this point, they don't, the, what the scriptures are made up of the Hebrew scriptures. But the total scriptures are going to be made up with what these guys are going to write. Right? And they need to be a credit. How, how are the, when I'm done with my little thing, I'm going to go to uh, Ron. Ron. <laughs> that how, how were the Old Testament prophets accredited? That they indeed were prophets. Speak, that God thus saith the Lord. How were they accredited? It came true. It came true in their yeah. time. And, and they gave, remember they gave uh, near-term fulfillment? So that their long-term prophecies about the coming Messiah that was going to be much later was true, just as true, because they showed that it was true because they showed a near-term fulfillment of that. Okay? You with me? Jesus did the same thing. He did the same thing. In this generation, this generation will not pass away until they see all these things take place. He's referring to the events that were going to occur in that generation. And that accredited him, if it, was, if it wasn't enough accreditation already, for everything else that he had to say. Ron? I'm, I'm just you know, struck with, if, if I were one of these guys who had been thrown into prison at this point, and you're sitting there, I, mean, I can't believe that they weren't going again, saying again, well, you know, kind of blew that, you know, now we're, now what are we gonna do kind of thing. We're sitting here in prison, we've been arrested, and I think that's what we go through many times is we get down on something, something happens, and we're all of a sudden we're, you know, in the funk, and we can't even begin to see how we're going to get out of this, you know, this mess that either I've created or you created or God, what's going on here, kind of a thing. And, and I'm just this last week I've had several occasions where I it was just amazing to me that how God worked. I would have never even began to comprehend or think outside the nine dots kind of thing of, of how that could get solved. And yeah. yet, when God comes in, and here he comes in, and I mean, he didn't tear the doors off or anything. I mean, that's the weird thing about this. But yeah, doesn't that sound familiar with something else that happened yeah. with Jesus? Yeah. yeah. In the tomb? Yeah. You know, how did, you know, we had guards outside this thing. We had this baby sealed and everything else. And all we see is the cloth laying there on the table. Yeah. Now, look, well, look, and my point is simply that if we think in terms of, and Jim will relate this this morning coming in, God wins. <laughs> yeah. God wins. Yeah, to make a play off of that point, Paul later, and, and if indeed it was being written for his defense, Paul was in prison, right? We're going to see at the end of the book of Acts, he's, that's where he is. And God doesn't break him out. He, he doesn't pull him out. He doesn't do anything. And I think this is the point that we want to make, and the, the point that I believe Jerry is pointing out too, is well, there's a bigger deal. It isn't the breaking out of prison, which is a thing that's most spectacular to make a great movie. But that wasn't the big deal. It was the life, this life. That's the big deal. And Paul didn't have that happen to him, but it didn't mean God wasn't working. God was doing the, a bigger thing. I mean, to, this week I shared with a couple of people very close to me going through the kind of thing you're talking about and uh, talking about from Philippians. Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. That's the life. He's sitting in prison. And he's saying, I've learned to be content. No matter what my circumstances are. 
And I told this person, I said, can you imagine what that'd be like if, because they're unsettled with their situation, I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if you were in this situation right now and yet you were content? Wouldn't that be a bigger deal? Because if, if the circumstances change and you get out of this situation, you know you're going to have another one. And wouldn't you like, because in this life you're going to have tribulation, wouldn't it be wonderful if you go through life content with all these circumstances that the rain falls on the just and the unjust? You're going to be there. This is the big deal, the new life. The new, this life is very uh, provocative to the observer. And even, even in the news, you watch things and how people that are Christians that are showing up in the non-Christian secular media has to point out, that's, that's amazing. I, I don't know how that person can, can have that attitude in that situation. Or I don't know how that person can have that peace with that going on. I listen to sports talk radio. Non-Christian guys talking, and they're talking about this. Because this is the new life. This is the new thing. So it's still going on today. David. I think probably far removed from where we were. When just, just a footnote on miracles. Uh, we should be uh, reminded that uh, the book of Revelation talks about another performing signs that will deceive many. And the difference is that uh, the elect will not be deceived. They'll be able to parse the truth. Yeah, yeah and uh, it's interesting. When we get into our next section, uh, that we're going to just playing off of that uh, because my perspective on Revelation is different than others. But that Jesus said that there will be false prophets. There will be those coming in my name saying I am the one. And, and we're going to see in the next section Luke alludes to these very people. Uh, the names of these guys. calls them by name. These, these guys that are coming and, and it says I'm I'll have to wait until next week. We get into Gamaliel, <laughs> and he stands up in the Sanhedrin, Jesus. and he says, you better be careful if you're going to try to squench us. And then he refers to these other ones that were false. Okay, so that's that. But let me just tie, let me just tie this up <coughs> so we get ready for next week. That, uh, so they, they go and, uh, to get them. The Sanhedrin wants to come, have them come and to sit in, and, and they want to cross-examine them again because... They're doing what they were told not to do. So they go and they go to get them, and they're not there, right? We already went through that, not there. So they bring them uh, to the uh, Sanhedrin. And uh, just to finish up here, uh, 24 through 26. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. Interesting again, where their mentality is. Didn't even daunt them at all that they got out of here and nothing, the guards were there and no, how did they get out? That wasn't even their interest. They were interested in maintaining the status quo. Verse 25, but someone came and reported to them that the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people, exclamation point. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people, that they might be stoned. So the scene's going to change next week, and they're now brought before the Sanhedrin, and they're going to figure out what to do with them. And there's a guy named Gamaliel, who is in one of the Sanhedrin members, that, why don't you guys find out who he is? Uh, if you don't know, you might take a look at that a little bit. And we're going to look at now how things proceed from here. Okay? It's, exciting, it's an exciting narrative, historical narrative, as the church is developing. And they are preaching this life, this new life. Amen? Amen.